This week began with Tropical Storm Nicholas reaching Category 1 hurricane force right before making landfall along the Texas Gulf Coast. And last week, Hurricane Larry reached Category 3 and then weakened, but not before causing power outages as a Category 1 in Newfoundland, Canada. The Atlantic hurricane season runs from June 1st through November 30th, and this year has already been record-setting. Hurricane Henry alone produced the rainiest hour on record in New York City, a record that was broken again less than two weeks later by Hurricane Ida. Here are just a few of the recent headlines. Ida made landfall off the coast of Louisiana, packing winds of up to 150 miles per hour. An extremely dangerous Cat 4 storm unleashing damaging winds, torrential rains, and a life-threatening storm surge. The remnants of Hurricane Ida delivering a historic soaking in the Northeast. Elsa's potential wrath is bringing up the issue of climate change and its effect on hurricanes. So here's what I'm wondering about. Are hurricanes getting more frequent? Stronger? More destructive? And is any of this connected to climate change? This is Nova Now, where we look for the answers behind the stormy headlines. I'm Alok Patel. Ah. All right, sorry, I, I guess we lost communications. Uh, we are looking at imminent landfall of this storm. If you were watching the news on August 29th, you might have seen Al Roker getting soaked by Hurricane Ida as it barreled through New Orleans. Uh, winds of 150 miles per hour are, 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 like, are right now forecast. Storm surges upwards of 15 to 16 feet, 20 inches of rain or more with this system. Ida is the latest storm to hit the U.S. as a Category 4 hurricane. But even after it was downgraded to a tropical storm, it wasn't finished. What people didn't expect was that as it kept on going, it stayed strong enough and it swept up enough water vapor to dump record amounts of rain in the New York area. In some places, the highest one hour rainfall total ever recorded. Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist and the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. She's also the author of Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world. In the States, dozens died in Ida's wake. It goes without saying that hurricanes are some of the most powerful natural phenomena on our planet. Floods and rip currents can result from a hurricane's strong winds, heavy rainfall, and storm surge, which is when coastal waters rise to abnormally high levels. Heho is convinced that the data shows that hurricanes are getting stronger and that it's because of climate change. Here's the thinking. Climate scientists estimate that 93% of the excess heat trapped in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases finds its way into the ocean. And warm water is hurricane fuel. What we are seeing is when they form, because there's so much more energy available to them, more of them are stronger, they're slower, so they move slower and they dump more rain on us. And it's for a very simple reason that as you warm the air, its capacity to hold water vapor goes up, it goes up quite fast, 7% for one degree Celsius increase in air temperature. Carrie Emanuel is a professor of atmospheric science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And this means that extreme rainstorms, not just hurricanes, but any kind of like strong thunderstorm or, or other kinds of storms, that rain will generally rain more. So as these storms move along, there's more water vapor for them to sweep up and dump on us. For example, with Hurricane Harvey that hit the city of Houston back in August 2017, we know that it had about 40% more rain than it would have if the same hurricane had happened 100 years ago. Also, the warmer ocean water evaporates quicker and that makes more water vapor. So there's this whole feedback effect going on where the warmer it gets, the stronger and more damaging the hurricanes get. And then there's also the fact that warmer water takes up more space. So sea levels rising for two reasons. Reason number one is because land-based ice in Greenland and Antarctica is melting and that water is going into the ocean. But the second reason is simply because as the ocean gets warmer, it actually literally takes up more space. So when a hurricane comes along, a lot of the damages due to hurricanes along the coast are because of storm surges. Well, as sea level rises, those surges can reach further and further inland, flooding more and more areas that wouldn't ordinarily be flooded. 
And as we destroy our coastal wetlands, and as we build more and more valuable infrastructure right along the coast, we're putting ourselves even more at risk. It's a lose, lose, lose. You may think, hey, hurricanes mainly affect coastal areas, but that's not as true as it once was. When hurricanes move over land, you know they weaken pretty quickly, right? You're unplugging them from the ocean, so they're not plugged into their energy source anymore. But because there's warmer air and more water vapor in the air and because they're getting stronger to begin with, we're also seeing that hurricanes are lasting longer at higher intensities over land than they used to. And Catherine Hayhoe says hurricanes and tropical storms are moving farther north before they dissipate. And that's because warmer water is spreading further poleward, and so they can maintain the hurricane status further northward than they used to. So it isn't like hurricanes have never made it to Canada before. Well, now, though, hurricanes are moving up the coast and along Halifax and even Newfoundland. They're getting storms that are still at hurricane strength because the warm ocean water is warm enough to keep them going further north. Warmer conditions also can cause wind speeds to go up. As you add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, you increase the upper limit of wind speed that you can have thermodynamically in a hurricane. Now, a very tiny percentage of actual storms reach this speed limit, but a few do, and it's very important to recognize that that goes up so that um, in the future we expect to see and we're beginning to see records being broken on wind speed in hurricanes. Climate scientists can model our atmosphere and oceans over vast scales, dial different factors up or down on the computer model, and a bunch of consequences fall out. And they see all of this. As temperatures get warmer, the models don't necessarily show hurricanes getting more frequent, at least not in the North Atlantic, but they predict that hurricanes get stronger and more intense, and extreme storms generally dump more rain. But how accurate are these climate models? Does nature actually behave the way computers predict? What do the observations on the ground tell us? That after the break. Okay, let's take a look at what these look like on the ground. When we think about hurricanes, there are a few important features to consider. Their frequency, how many of them we see in a season, their track, so their location and trajectory, their size, the diameter of the storm, and their intensity, meaning how strong they become. A hurricane is a, technically something we call a tropical cyclone. Frank Marks has been a research meteorologist for 42 years at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He directs the Hurricane Research Division for NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. They tend to form over oceans in the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, typically in the summer part of the year for that hemisphere. When the oceans are the warmest, they are relatively rare. Typically on the globe, any year, there's between 90 and 100 tropical cyclones. That varies very little. Uh, It hasn't changed much over the time I've been studying them. And Mark says that though North Atlantic hurricanes are causing more damage than in the past, that's not necessarily because they're more intense. You know, we've had very intense tropical cyclones almost back to our records go back to the 1850s. Uh, And so there's been immense storms doing a lot of damage. The problem is that population has shifted. And so our risk of damage has gone up tremendously. Plus, there's been a demographic population shift towards the coastlines, towards the warmer climates as we've developed things like air conditioning and got rid of malaria. You know, people have migrated towards the tropics. So even though there's no noticeable change in the actual storms, if there is, it's very slight. I haven't seen it in 40 years. We have made a dramatic change in the way we live, which has made us extremely vulnerable. You know, the lifestyle we have, the amount of property we put into the storm's potential paths, the areas of the most growth in the United States has been in hurricane-prone areas. 
There's universal agreement because the data is absolutely uncontroversial that, that there's huge increases in hurricane damage all around the world. Here again is Kerry Emanuel. But there's also universal agreement that most or maybe all of that signal is demographic. It's not meteorological or climatological. It's just that um, the, the world's population exposed to hurricanes has tripled since 1970. That's not just in the U.S., that's all around the world. So you have more people living in places with hurricanes, you're going to get more damage. But what about the idea that climate change is making the storms more intense and dangerous? Is such a change actually showing up in our observations of real storms over the last few decades? Kerry Emanuel thinks this kind of change could be hard to see because compared to models, real-world data are noisy. The theoretical prediction of increased intensity is such that we would only expect the signal to emerge from the noise about now. Uh, you know, it wouldn't have emerged 20 years ago, for example. The fact that we haven't unequivocally seen a signal compared to the noise is no reason to disregard the risks that were long ago predicted and rely on very, very solid physics. Most of our observations come from the North Atlantic, but that only accounts for about 12% of the world's hurricanes. It's not like science is decided by a vote, but there are some things that we feel we know very well, like hurricanes ought to produce more rain and other kinds of storms. As the temperature increases, it's just such simple physics, it's very hard to argue against it. Um, there is a tendency among some people dealing with this problem to treat climate change as a problem of signal detection and attribution. But it isn't the whole story by any means. I'd like to say that if we had 10 years of climate records, which would be horrible, we would still be fairly confident about um, stating that we are putting ourselves at risk of worse damage from hurricanes just based on simple theory and, and models. But despite all the noise, some studies are seeing a clear signal, like one published last year based on satellite data from 1979 to 2017. It's very tricky because satellites have improved over time. As part of this study, atmospheric research scientist James P. Cosson, along with other researchers, actually degraded the quality of the modern satellites to match that of the older satellites. And when he looked at that, what he found specifically was that the proportion of hurricanes that reach high category, high Saffir Simpson category, three, four, or five, has been increasing over time in a statistically significant way. The skill that's generally used to characterize hurricane strength was developed in the 1970s by engineer Herbert Saffir and meteorologist Robert Simpson. Hence its name, the Saffir Simpson Scale. And it is exclusively based on the maximum sustained wind speed in a hurricane. Daniel Swain is a climate scientist with the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA. So you get a category one, two, three, four, or five storm based only on what the maximum sustained wind in that particular storm is. But a hurricane's strength is more than its wind speed. So the current scale, says Swain, isn't perfect. Okay, back to Kerry Emanuel and that study showing that the proportion of hurricanes reaching high category number on the Saffir Simpson scale is increasing. And um, I think that's an important result. It's the first time we've sort of seen that signal. We didn't really expect to see it until about now in this very noisy and, and, and somewhat um, deficient data. Um, but again, it, was, it, it, it is coupled with a strong theoretical prediction that that is what we should see. And so when you take them together, it's a pretty strong case that we have a pretty high risk of more intense hurricanes. So the physics is pretty clear. According to everything we know about how the atmosphere and the oceans work, as the planet's temperature rises, hurricanes are supposed to get more intense. But when it comes to knowing exactly how much that's already happening, the current data are messier and are telling a less obvious story. What we do know is hurricanes are causing more damage to us. We humans interacting with these disasters are what cause the suffering. Catherine Hayhoe again. So, you know, if a hurricane never hit land, would it be a disaster? 
if we didn't live along the coastline, would a hurricane be a disaster? No, we'd be like, oh, a hurricane hit 100 miles over there, but we live over here. Putting ourselves in harm's way is what causes this suffering. And often for many people, they don't have a choice. It's not like they can choose where they live. And whether it's in Houston or Miami or New York, or whether it's in Mumbai or Madagascar, it's always the people who already have the short end of the stick who are suffering the most from these impacts. And these vulnerabilities, says Heho, will intensify with climate change. We've had hurricanes on this planet before we had humans. So it isn't that climate change is creating hurricanes, it's taking something that already exists and making it a lot worse. Climate change is what the US military now calls a threat multiplier. It takes every other issue we are already concerned about today and it makes it worse. What trends are you seeing in public opinion now? You know, are you finding fewer people are receptive to scientific evidence? Are you seeing the opposite? Is your job getting easier or harder? I want to share my favorite cartoon with you. I know we can't see the cartoon, but let me just tell you what it says. And in the cartoon, there's a set of physicians who are saying to each other, well, surely if we just tell the public the facts about COVID and vaccines, everybody will do the right thing. And then beside them, you see a bunch of climate scientists literally rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> in a, in a, it's black humor because we have said the same thing for decades. If we just tell the public the facts, yes, we've checked. It is not volcanoes. It's not natural cycles. It absolutely is us. It's bad. We need to act now. Everybody will just do it, right? No, wrong. Catherine Hayhoe says people who are dismissive of climate change get a lot of airtime. And so we tend to think the biggest problem is that there's people who just don't know the science. It turns out that people who are dismissive are only 7% of the population, a very loud percent, but 75% say, yeah, sure, it's, it's, I know it's real, but only 35% of us think it matters. That's the biggest gap we have. And there's even a name for it, it's called psychological distance. Do you think it will affect me? And everybody just says, no, we don't think it matters to us. And so that's why talking about it is so important. Not talking about Greenland or polar bears or Antarctica, talking about what's happening where we live, how wildfires are burning greater area, how the smoke is making our kids sick, how the hurricanes flooded our home, how you know, extreme heat put people in the hospital where we live. Connecting the dots between what we already care about, our health, number one, our kids and our family's health, the safety of the place that we live, the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, that is the number one thing that every single one of us can do to help move the needle on climate action. When I was a student, I thought climate change was an environmental issue that environmentalists cared about and the rest of us sort of wished them well. What I've learned is that climate change is an everything issue. Sure, it's an environmental issue, but it's also a health issue. It's an economic issue. It's a national security issue. It's a poverty issue and a hunger issue, a humanitarian issue, a refugee crisis issue. And so by extension, to care about climate change, we don't have to be a certain type of person. We don't have to vote a certain type of way. We only have to be one thing. And that one thing is a human who lives on this planet. Nova Now is a production of GBH and PRX. It's produced by Terrence Bernardo, Ari Daniel, Jocelyn Gonzalez, Isabel Hibbard, Sandra Lopez Monsalve, and Rosalind Tordes Silias. Julia Court and Chris Schmidt are the co executive producers of Nova. Suki Bennett is senior digital editor. Christina Monin is associate researcher. Robin Kasmer is science editor. And Devin Robbins is managing producer of podcasts at GBH. Our theme music is by the DJ who can always keep the party surging, DJ Kid Koala. I'm Alok Patel. We'll be back in two weeks, which is more than enough time for you to get prepared in the event of a natural disaster. You may want to gather important phone numbers, an emergency medicine kit, locate local shelters, make sure you have food, water supply, power source, important documents, keep gas and a first aid kit in your car, and go over an emergency evacuation plan with your friends and family. And keep a lookout for those pets as well. Stay empowered and stay safe. Okay. 
GBH.